Thanks, Jeff, and welcome everybody to our strategic update and in the presentation. With particular focus on the successful commitments for $12 million, we have a place announced this morning and launching of the uh, holder purpose plan at the same time. I will focus on. Sorry to update. interrupt, uh, Dr. Goulet. Uh, we're having a yeah. bit of trouble with your line. I'll reconnect you in just a moment. Okay. Please stand by. The conference will recommence in just a moment. Thank you, sir. Please continue. Yes. Look, apologies for the uh, for the audio problem uh, due to uh, due to the vagaries of the internet and telecommunications. Um, so, as I was saying, it's my pleasure to talk about our update and capital raising, the uh, twelve million dollar placement for which we have commitments uh, as announced this morning, and the share purchase plan. And I will focus my presentation on the new information and not dwell on uh, information we've described and presented in the, pr in the past. So uh, in this statement, as you would imagine, we have forward-looking statements and this disclaimer speaks to that. Um, and on the third slide I have here, the, the statement I made when I first took the job uh, as CEO and Managing Director at the company in March. Uh, and the point I would make here is that in my previous job at Principia Biopharma in the US, I was attracted to that for the science, the people, and for the sort of attractiveness of, the, of it being somewhat de-risked. And I find Actinogen still today to be a similar story in the sense that we've got excellent people, excellent science, and a very promising phase two molecule. And the de-risking for this company is all is, is the extensive clinical data, uh, dose ranging data with our PET study and other data. Uh, on clinical safety that gives us a very strong position to move forward into multiple clinical phase two trials. I've personally invested more money into Actinogen as I did in the, uh, in the situation with Principia, and I will be investing uh, a pro rata amount to that uh, investment in this current placement. We summarize Actinogen's story uh, to those who don't know us as a, we are a neurotherapeutics developer realizing a revolutionary therapy uh, called Janemem so neurology patients can live their best lives. And as you'll see, we've now announced depression as a third indication and fills out the portfolio of three primary and somewhat different diseases that we are investigating in clinical trials. The capital raising we announced today uh, includes a number of highlights uh, associated and funded by that raise. In particular, we've announced that depression uh, is our third disease area for study. There's a strong cortisol rationale for depression. In particular, uh, this is a disease strongly associated with cognitive impairment, uh, and it's a very interesting and, uh, and scientifically uh, intriguing pursuit, uh, phase two for us to pursue. The Fragile X syndrome trial is being expanded to sites in North America for a number of reasons in particular to accelerate timelines and involve key global thought leaders. Really the majority of the key uh, expert centers in this disease are in North America and the USA in particular. In addition, we are adding a, a third dose ranging five milligram arm to the original design, 
which improves the uh, quality, uh, gives us an ability to, to measure dose response. And that, thus, we're adding an extra 25 patients, a total of 75 in that study. And then intriguingly, we have, uh, we have I've realized that we uh, have the possibility to retrospectively analyze stored plasma samples from the previous mild Alzheimer's phase two called Xanadu. That trial, uh, those trial data uh, should be available in the second half of, of next year. This is quite important because uh, potentially uh, modifying underlying disease modifying biomarkers would indicate that the drug could slow progression or even halt progression of the disease. And of course, that is the holy grail in Alzheimer's research. Uh, in addition, we've previously announced that enrollment in the Xanamia Part A trial in healthy older volunteers is going well. And that uh, we, uh, we're now uh, letting you know that the last few patients are to be enrolled in the coming few days. Uh, and thus, the results we can confidently say will be available in the second quarter of next year. And thus, with this uh, expansion of our program, we now have fully funded three phase two programs in three different diseases. All of them have a strong scientific rationale based on cortisol, but all of them have different endpoints uh, and are somewhat diverse and separate from each other in terms of their conduct and scientific rationale. Uh, on this slide, I'm just going to touch briefly on the mechanism and why Xanamem, our molecule, is unique. It's an oral once-a-day capsule, and uh, it is a drug that gets into the brain in high concentrations adequate to inhibit its target enzyme, 11-beta-HSD1, uh, sufficiently to have it, the clinical effects we are, um, we are showing in our phase two trials. So previously, we showed improved cognition with uh, with the cog state sensitive cog, uh, computerized test battery. And so uh, with this enzyme we, uh, inhibitor, we hope to modify cortisol inside brain cells in a way that uh, can improve depression, fragile X, as well as Alzheimer's disease. Previously, no other molecules with this target, we believe, were able to get into the brain in adequate levels. Another uh, Summary slide here, which uh, I will just touch on a couple of details. We have a drug in Xanamem with very favorable pharmaceutical properties, in particular, a low dose and a low drug interaction potential. Uh, and as I'll show you in a couple of slides, uh, demonstrated target engagement in the brain, excellent dose ranging data, and we have full engagement with the hormone axis uh, involving cortisol. Uh, we've got more than 250 and nearly 300 actually subjects or patients safely treated at this stage. A large safety database at a 10 milligram dose from the Xanadu study of 12 weeks therapy and cognitive enhancement activity shown in our previous healthy older volunteer study, which is being reprised in the current Xanamia study. So we have strong cortisol and scientific rationale for all of our indications. Previously, the molecule was in license from University of Edinburgh, as most people know, and we have good patents in place. And Proforma Cash at the end of the last quarter was in the order of 27, 28 million. We have a strong and good looking management and leadership team, including the board. And I think you're familiar with most people. We have a number of advisory boards. They're not all shown here. Uh, really, uh, it's exciting for us to be working working with the best of the best, and not just in Alzheimer's, but also in the endocrinology of the target and cortisol, and now uh, new advisors with Fragile X and depression. On this chart, uh, you see the progress of our, uh, of our stock over the last 12 months. And a couple of features here are, uh, are important. And in particular, what happened in the middle of the year when there was a big spike in price to about 19.5 cents. That was the time leading up to the Biogen Aduhelm approval for the very first treatment in Alzheimer's disease to be approved in nearly 20 years. There was a lot of excitement in the field and that excitement is justified, even though that drug has arguably uh, um, not, the, not very good efficacy, not very good safety, but the FDA said that they would approve it based on a surrogate or provisional approval uh, by the drug's ability to clear a, a biomarker called amyloid, a protein in the brain. This therefore says to other companies such as Actinogen, we can get uh, potentially a drug approved for Alzheimer's several years earlier by 
intelligently using biomarkers and potentially surrogates with imaging in a way that Biogen did uh, to show that our drug is effective and potentially get an early approval to help patients. Also, the actual efficacy or, or activity level that the agency said they would accept for an approval was quite modest, and that also is very encouraging for drug developers such as Actinogen. Uh, as of a few days ago, we had a market capitalization of around 270 million. Our largest uh, shareholder, BVF Partners, uh, contributed to the current placement, as did it myself. So our pipeline slide now looks uh, filled out uh, with Alzheimer's disease, Fragile X syndrome, and depression. These three different disease indications are somewhat different in their approach to the portfolio. One could call the Alzheimer's disease our big-to-market approach. Uh, getting a successful Alzheimer's drug is obviously a multi-billion dollar opportunity. For Fragile X, this is a smaller market opportunity. It's an orphan disease. Uh, we have an open IND, uh, recently agreed with the FDA, and the phase two trial is commencing. And that's really our fast-to-market approach, where we would anticipate with a successful phase two going into a little phase three study straight away. We also have the rare pediatric designation and priority review voucher for that program. And then thirdly, depression is somewhere in between in terms of its speed. Uh, the program has very clear clinical and regulatory pathways, and from a timing point of view, it's somewhere in the middle between Fragile X and Alzheimer's disease. It provides a lot of diversification and optionality in terms of partnerships and, uh, and clinical development. The next few slides cover Alzheimer's disease, and most of these slides are not new, and so I will touch on just a couple of key points. Each of our programs has a very strong scientific rationale. Uh, cortisol is directly toxic to brain cells and highly associated with brain shrinkage, loss of cognition and ability to, to remember things. Uh, experimentally, a mouse model using an enzyme inhibitor of our target does protect against cognitive decline and in some cases reduces amyloid protein formation. And of course, we've shown our own drug to improve human cognition in healthy older volunteers. The pivotal data uh, from our, our PET or positron emission tomography study is shown here, and this has been shown before, so I'll, I'll be fairly quick, but uh, these data are very, very important because this is a dose ranging study where we studied between five and 30 milligrams, which is not shown. And what you see on the left is the green and gold pattern of the enzyme activity in the brain. This is a, a meld of about 30 patients. Uh, on the right, you see the near complete suppression of uh, that enzyme activity with 5, 10, and 20 milligrams. With the possible exception of a little bit of blue at the bottom there in the cerebellum in the 5 milligram group. And it's for this reason that we are focused on the lower dose range of 5 and 10 milligrams in our clinical program. Because based on animal studies, only 30 to 60% inhibition of this target is needed for neuroprotection. So this study is critical in guiding us to uh, the correct dosage ra dosing range uh, to explore in our trials. And the other key piece of data which I've mentioned is the uh, improved cognitive activity in healthy older people in our previous Susanna Hess study, shown in red the faster reaction times uh, versus blue in placebo of uh, working memory and visual attention and a trend for psychomotor function. The effect sizes here are large, and we are using similar, the similar cog state endpoint in our current Xanamia trial. The approach to Alzheimer's is working towards a treatment for the early stages of the disease. This is called mild cognitive impairment, where there is no, not yet functional impairment and mild Alzheimer's where the uh, functional impairment, for example, starting to get lost or inability to drive anymore uh, starts to happen. Previously in our Xanadu phase two trial, which was a very short trial uh, several years ago, uh, endpoints that were not particularly susceptible to improvement in that mild population were used, something called ADIS COG and another one called ADCOMS. Uh, however, the big news there is that by uh, utilizing the stored samples uh, from blood that we have available to us now, 
We can use new biomarkers, which were only available really in the last couple of years for analysis, and so they really couldn't have been done before. But we'll now be able to look back at whether uh, our drug is able to modify in a clinically significant way underlying biomarkers of neuroinflammation and protein uh, in, and potentially therefore indicate disease modification potential. So the current study, Xanamia, um, the part A we'll read out in the second quarter. It's a healthy older subjects uh, study with about 105 people in three different groups of five versus 10 and 10 milligrams versus placebo. We're using sensitive cognition tests as we did in the previous study called COGSTATE. But in addition, we're using an old fashioned test called the digit symbol substitution test or coding test, which is a form of measurement of something called executive function. Uh, this is not as sensitive as the COGSTATE test, but it will uh, give us a bit of an idea about whether this endpoint should be used in the future. It's also an endpoint that's been used previously by the FDA and the European Authority for regulatory approvals. Subsequent to our biomarker work and the Part A data, we will explore a Part B study, which will be in patients with early stage Alzheimer's disease, prospectively measuring biomarkers and cognition using those same endpoints. And just one little note on our retrospective analysis. Uh, the original study had a large number of patients, 185. Uh, it studied 10 milligrams daily for uh, 12 weeks, which is ideal as our proof of concept dose. Uh, the patients were selected at that time without biomarker, uh, blood, CSF, or imaging confirmation of disease. And there may have been a significant proportion of patients in that study that didn't actually have the true Alzheimer's disease. So we are now able uh, to uh, to reconsent sites and patients and put their guard, guardians. We know from our feasibility most sites are willing to participate and we have an established uh, expert laboratory uh, in, uh, ready to go. Biomarkers uh, that we'll be assessed include important things that are increasingly being validated for Alzheimer's, in particular, in particular TAL181 is of great interest, as is GFAP for microglial function. The next set of slides talks about Fragile X, which is an important uh, syndrome and the commonest uh, inherited cause of intellectual disability, it, uh, manifesting predominantly uh, and in a more severe form in boys because they only have one X chromosome. There's a high unmet medical need because management of this disease is complex uh, with lifelong treatment required uh, and typically treatment for ADHD, uh, sedatives, other things are used. None of these are ideal. Um, for us, the, the FDA has already awarded, uh, awarded us the rare pediatric disease designation and we're eligible for orphan drug. Um, it broadens the number of partners we have in the orphan space in particular. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a relatively fast to market approach. The global market size is considerable at 250 million for an orphan disease. Uh, and there are related indications we could also uh, investigate if the phase two is positive. The priority review voucher that I mentioned that you get along with your own priority review from the FDA is tradable for around 100 million US on today's market. But we only get that voucher when, at the time we get the approval for the drug for Fragile X. There's a lot of science behind this program, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't have chosen to go here. Um, there's relationship with cortisol to symptoms, uh, there's signaling uh, evidence from glutamate linked to cortisol response. Knockout mice show raised cortisol and raised 11-beta HSD1 enzyme. And in a fragile X model, an 11-beta HSD1 inhibitor has shown normalization of anxiety. And that's shown in this slide where you see the orange bar go back to normal levels uh, with treatment in, in a mouse model. So the hope is that this drug uh, is both a cognitive improver uh, it treats anxiety that may uh, relate to improved behavior problems and learning disability. And so the hope is that the treatment with Xanamem will make a material and measurable difference, not just in individual symptom domains, but in, uh, in the global uh, state of the patient as measured by their carers, parents, and physicians. And lastly, our third indication I'm pleased to talk about is major depressive disorder. Uh, the first trial will uh, assess at the ability for the treatment to not just target 
cognitive impairment, but also depression itself. And there's some theoretical scientific uh, rationale for that uh, as well. A little background on depression. It's very common, as I'm sure you know, neurocognitive symptoms are a typical feature, meaning most people with moderate to severe depressive depression do complain of foggy thinking and bodily sensations of, of heaviness and other things, which are quite plausibly related to elevated intracellular cortisol levels. One antidepressant, interestingly called vortioxetine, has a regulatory uh, cognitive benefit claim based around the DSST test that we are using. It's called vortioxetine. Uh, it has sales of approximately US 500 million to give you a bit of an idea of what a niche and antidepressant with cognitive uh, benefit might uh, look like. The science behind depression is interesting as well. Uh, cognitive symptoms often persist during remission uh, and particularly in severe so-called melancholic patients. Elevated cortisol levels are strongly associated. Um, cortisol is associated with outcomes and, and relapse. Um, there's some interesting but not consistent data of inhibiting the cortisol system with a glucocorticoid receptor antagonist called mesopristone to improve depression. And of course, we've shown improved cognition in our own studies to date. So it's a really interesting program and a lot of academics around the world believe this is uh, an, an excellent indication for this target. Sorry. Uh, one of the reasons we like depression as an indication is that there is a very well established clinical and regulatory path, um, established endpoints, uh, recent approvals to look at. Um, there's a, a drug called esketamine, Spravato, which was recently approved for treatment resistant depression. Chintelix is the vortioxetine drug I mentioned before. Uh, and we are pleased to have consultants uh, who've worked on a number of these programs helping us design the clinical trial and the program overall. And on this slide, just a summary of the many different deals done in depression. Because it's a common disease and still relatively poorly treated, there's a lot, been a lot of deal-making activity um, with significant upfronts and in some cases, uh, you know, getting into the billions of dollars in terms of the overall value. So to summarize, um, we're focused on a number of things. Uh, in particular, accelerating clinical development now in three parallel indications, forward planning at the same time. So we're not forgetting to optimize our manufacturing, uh, do the re required regulatory clinical pharmacology and non-clinical studies that you need to get to a marketing approval in, in, in a reasonable time. At the same time, uh, I'm always talking to our pharma and biotech partners, both large and small. There's a lot of interest in our programs and uh, those discussions are continually being held. I mentioned the priority review voucher before, which does have a net present value today. And of course, the peer Alzheimer's companies are interesting because they too have had a, a spike in interest uh, in the middle of the year, uh, along with the FDA approval of the first Alzheimer's drug. And you know, their valuations range from 200 million to, to the 2 billion, two or 3 billion range. Uh, and thus there is you know, significant near-term and medium-term growth potential uh, as we generate uh, data similar to those more highly valued companies in the next year or two. And to that, um, this slide, slide summarizes where we will be uh, in our clinical trial readouts in 2022 and 2023. For Alzheimer's disease, the Xanamia Part A cognition results will be in the second quarter of next year. The Xanadu retrospective biomarker, potentially disease modifying results in the second half of the year and the Xanamia Part B prospective biomarker and cognition data in patients with early Alzheimer's disease will read out the year after. For Fragile X syndrome, uh, we've opened the IND, uh, we've signed a letter of intent with a key collaborator contract research organization, and we're commencing that study uh, presently with a view to having results in 2023. And depression, we are commencing, or we have commenced the design of the program anticipating starting the trial next year and results in 2023 as well. At the same time, we're very focused on getting peer-reviewed publications of key data, such as the PET study, which was recently presented at the CTAD conference, 
and other peer review uh, publications and leveraging a number of interesting academic and grant collaborations that we are not talking about publicly at this time. And lastly, to the office summary for the capital raising, uh, the structure is an institutional placement, and as I mentioned, we've got commitments for 12 million, uh, firm commitments for 12 million, and we're launching a shared purchase plan, which will open next Monday, targeted to raise uh, around 3 million. The placement price is at one at, at point, uh, 135 or 13.5 cents a share, which represents a discount of just uh, under 16% to the last close of 16 cents per share on Monday, and the SPP will be the same price. Um, you will be, as shareholders, you'll be able to subscribe up to $30,000 uh, of new shares under the SPP, uh, and uh, the lead manager for this is Bell Potter Security. And the use of funds broadly is shown on this uh, slide, but it's largely as I've outlined earlier in the presentation. Expanding the Fragile X program to North America uh, and adding an extra dosing arm uh, will be about 7 million. Depression associated with cognitive impairment, uh, that's a, likely to be an Australian study, uh, 5 million. The biomarker data, 1 million. Some additional manufacturing, 1 million. And offer cost and working capital around 1 million, making a total of 15. So the indicative timetable for the raise is that uh, the placement will settle next week. The SPP will open next Monday and close two weeks later, and the issue of those shares uh, a couple of days later. And so with that, I'm going to uh, pause and ask if there are any questions, and uh, thank you again for your attention and your interest and belief in the company and the excitement and potential for patients that this drug Xanamem brings. Okay, Steve, um, uh, there is one question from Alan. Will the Xanadu biomarker analysis finish before Xanamere Part B starts? Uh, thanks, Alan, that's a great question. Uh, at this stage, we are in the final stages of feasibility. So, uh, it, you know, with our clinical trials, we look at each data set and make those kind of timing decisions based on data rather than just anticipating. So I can't, so I, the simple answer is I'm not sure I can give you a definitive answer at this point. You know, our hope and the team is working hard to bring those biomarker data uh, forward sooner rather than later so that um, we can, you know, make earlier decisions about that. There are no further questions at this time, Steve. Okay, um, well, if there are no further questions, um, I thank everybody for their attention and, and their interest and belief in actinogen. And um, on behalf of the team, uh, you know, thank you. And we look forward to delivering some exciting results in 2022 and 2023. Oh, uh, hold on, there's one. <laughs> <laughs> Just one sneak in, sorry, Steve. No problem. Um, and look, if, if, if for anybody else, uh, that if, if we do close off, uh, there is an opportunity for us to get back in touch with you to uh, answer your question. This is from Ashley. Uh, will commercial manufacturing be done in-house or by contract manufacturers? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, Pretty much, even the big pharma companies like Pfizer um, do all do, do mainly contract manufacturing. Um, so we would anticipate, um, you know, uh, being a small to mid-sized company initially, uh, the contract manufacturing but would be done. We've announced previously that Corden Pharma in Switzerland are our current manufacturer. Uh, there were very well-regarded potential commercial manufacturer. Um, and so, yes, it would more than likely be um, not, not something you would build in-house. I think that is complete this time. <laughs> no other questions. All right. So, um, again, thank you, everybody. And um, we look forward to, as I said, delivering great things in the coming year or two.